My name is Rachel, and I'm a currently a student, and I bank with RBC. My name is Florian. I'm currently a third-year student, and I bank with BMO. My name is Val, and I'm actually entering the workforce next year, and I bank with TD. So hopefully by the end of this recommendation, we will all be convinced that we should become loyal clients of Desjardins. <laughs> <laughs> so, to begin, we're just going to go over our agenda. So this is kind of taking a look at today's capabilities and seeing how we can apply that for your future. So just to begin, we're going to start with our ambition. So what do you want to achieve as Desjardins? Two, we're going to look at where to play. So this is really what field are we looking to go into and what space we're looking to capture. Next, we're going to highlight um, how to win. So this is just what is our strategy to tackle the space that we want to win, or that we want to play in, and how are we going to use that strategy to make Desjardins the biggest and best player in the banking industry. And lastly, we're just going to use our capabilities to support our strategy. And so this consists of our timeline, implementation, finances, etc. So to begin is our ambition. So just taking a look at our ambition, we just really wanted to give you a brief overview of our strategy and so what it's going to look like. So first of which, we're going to do a three-pronged strategy, or a strategy implementing three different things. First of which, we want to um, really um, drive the user experience. So we want to improve upon that so that you're going to really attract millennials. Two, we want to really gamify the whole experience so it'll create high switching costs for your users and really keep them within the system of Desjardins and the online banking system that you provide for them. And lastly, we want to um, have you collect behavioral data. So it's really understanding who your clients are so that you're, you're going to be able to keep them and also drive forward in the future, you're going to be able to retain them long term as well because that's your goal. And so next, we're going to look at your impacts. So through this strategy, what are we going to try to achieve? Well, the first of which is we're really going to see um, loyalty with um, your current members, and we want to really drive new members as well. And the second of which is that we're going to attract new members from the millennial community, the millennial space, which we'll go into later. And lastly, we really want to understand your consumer habits. So where are they spending? Um, where can you make the most impact, etc.? And so by implementing our strategy, um, we're really going to be able to, by implementing our community strategy, Desjardins will be really be able to enhance its role as a bank in the community by demonstrating a strong understanding of our target consumers through our actionable strategy over promotional campaigns. 
So what does this mean? Um, my colleague Val is going to go into where to play. Thanks. So the first discussion that we really had was what is it in the banking industry that really drove like where we are today? And the key uh, driver that we see today in the banking industry is the concept of trust and stability among banks. Obviously, there's a lot of personal data and a lot of personal information that is stored within any given bank. So a bank is really incorporated into everybody's lifestyle. Then we see that millennials, which are the target demographic that we're talking about today, have actually very unique spending habits. So for instance, our generation is not necessarily thinking about buying our house, but rather buying uni uh, university tuition. So we do have a very interesting way that we allocate our money, and another um, example of that is petty spending. So I'm very guilty of using Uber when I only could walk 10 minutes or so and ordering Fudora sushi on nights when I'm very stressed after university. Um, and finally, millennials, we very much value education because we understand that that is what's going to drive our success in the future. So there is currently a disconnect between the bank values and the millennial values. And when we thought about this and had a discussion, we realized that this was driven by the 2008-2009 financial crisis. In this crisis, the previous generations made it a bit more difficult for our generations to generate that income and have massive savings. And that's why our consumer spending is so different. We also like to have the concept of a story behind any purchase that we have. And that's why when we go to brunch, we buy an avocado toast for 12 or $15 because we know that money's not going for a house and it encompasses that healthy lifestyle story that we like. So like I said before, there's a disconnect and our recommendation is going to actually bridge this. Yeah, so let's look a little bit into what the market currently offers. And what we see here is that banking as a commodity, such as let's, we're, have, we're gonna have a credit card, we're gonna have debit card, et cetera. Then there's this new trend arising banking more as a service. We're talking private wealth management, we're talking about, uh, for example, Tangerine offering specific services that the traditional bank that backs it, for example, uh, Scotiabank would traditionally have, right? These, all of these add-ons, that's a service. But where does Desjardins actually stand, right? And what we, what we saw is that Desjardins stands more as a community that's kind of separate from the rest. So what does that really mean is that you have a great opportunity. You're different from the rest of the banks out there. So, in terms of um, certain products that they could be offering, uh, for example, block spending ability um, in a traditional bank, they say, okay, you can only spend this much uh, per X period of time. Uh, service would be uh, AI analytics, automated savings transfers, for example, on Tangerine, where there's a thing called the rounding feature, where, um, for example, something costs uh, $2.99, but it would automatically bill $3, one cent would be get, get transferred into the savings account. That already exists, right? But what are the community aspects that Desjardins can offer and how are you going to be able to implement that? That's what we're talking today. So, we talked about ones being restricted, something that's passive, we want to implement an active strategy. So, how to win. So now let's, let's take a look at the overview of our strategy. So how are we gonna win through the space that we've already shown you? So first of which, we really want to leverage our community strategy so that Desjardins will be able to really attract new members because that is our goal. And so we're gonna, our goal as, we, as I said, we're really trying to retain existing young members and attract non-members um, that are starting work. So those are our two main targets. And so we're gonna do this through a two-pronged strategy. So the first of which is we're really going to um, enhance the user experience. And so uh, my colleague Val will go into that a bit later. And two, we're really trying to gamify a simulation to really build skills that millennials can use and apply and also take with them to, um, into new products that they build with Desjardins, like for example, investing, et cetera. But we also will go into that later. And then through these two strategies, we really wanna build an impact of one, like we said, we want to create loyalty with the millennials with your bank because there's such an easy switching cost between um, young millennials. We have no loyalty right now and we really want to build that and create that through your community. And two, we really want to attract new members and we want to do this um, so that they they have benefits and incentives to come to your bank um, because at the end of the day, you, want, you need customers and you want to build profit. And lastly, we understand and we want you to understand your consumer habits and we want to do this by building data and building data through um, your new members. So first we're going to discuss how to enhance the user experience through a different tool that you could offer. So currently our, our friend Flo is going to explain to, he, to you one of the struggles that he faces at his bank BMO. So I'm currently a BMO user. And I'm also a finance student, which means that I care a lot about how I spend, right? <laughs> so I, I go onto the BMO portal, na na na, so on and so forth, and I just start to track, you know, my, my spendings on my credit card. What do I see? I see 38% discretionary spending. I see 
11% others, and 22% recurring billings. What does that even mean, right? As a first year student back then coming into university, I didn't understand what that was. And that's what we're trying to mitigate, to instead of having 38% discretionary spending, they could actually bucket into things such as food, such as um, clothing, such as coffee, et cetera, and the recurring billings such as rent, um, your, your phone plan, et cetera. We want to make it, well, exactly into that, right? A drag and drop interface, such as what you would see in Tableau or Power BI, where it's very easy for the user to, to drag and drop what exactly they want to see visually. Right? So what you would have, for example, would be the allocations of breakfast, which is lunch spent that you would see on the pie chart, how much you're spending, how much I can uh, stop spending on like, uh, driving, um, taking Ubers, etc. And at the end have this consolidated information at the bottom that says, okay, this is 12% of my budget is spent on brunch. Maybe I should stop going to brunch on Sundays, <laughs> right? Uh, something like that. Great, thank you, Flo. Now I'm going to drive into the second part of the recommendation, which has to do with gamification and actually a simulation to help build financial skills, whether you're an incoming first year who's just entering their financial experience or if you're entering the workforce and you don't know what to do with money that you never had before. Um, so the idea behind this is to communicate your company value of educating people, whether it's people that are within your membership and have an account, or if it's general public who you can actually convert to now become a member. So the way that we're going to do this is through the user experience and interface again, um, and leveraging your digital website and competencies that you already have. And the concept is to build games and specifically simulations that are memorable for the user um, and actually have them both interact with your website and create that engagement and relationship and brand association of financial literacy, as well as actually coming up with a way to achieve your goal of educating the public and making them retain the knowledge that you just provided them with. So the idea behind this is to have an investment simulation. So this is a fun idea. We actually stole it from a class activity that we had. And this is a potentially a great way for finance professors to do an in-class activity as well, which is great outreach. But the idea um, is driven by an example. So like we said at the beginning of the presentation, us as millennials, we have very interesting spending habits. And because we feel a little bit more insecure about those spending habits, we like to take ownership over our income. So yes, we have jobs and we like to actually you know, live a normal adult life, but we do like to explore investment opportunities as well. However, for myself, I don't really know anything about investment. Despite being in my fourth year, I'm taking intro to finance right now. Um, so what can I do through this interface to actually be better at that? Well, I can have some information provided to me and do sort of like a quiz where I'm given information about three different companies and maybe some suggestions or best practices on how to invest. Then based on that information, I can pick a company and then go to the next phase of this simulation. That phase may be something more personal about me and I get to play the game of life, if you will, and choose one of three options. I either got a new job, got a new promotion, or I moved to a different city. So these are things that I behaviorally do that could potentially impact the types of decisions that I make with my finances. And once this information is put into the simulation, there's a quick time lapse that goes two, three, five years, however the user wants to set. And then it can actually do just a general data simulation of what that investment would look like based on the decisions that I made. So I had fun doing this. I was able to actually learn if my decisions were correct and I can get feedback so that when I actually go and take my real money, it's a little bit lower of a risk. <laughs> um, and the key thing behind this as well is obviously this experience and making sure that the user retains the information. But also from your side, you will be able to use this, uh, these questions as a way to gather data. And we're going to jump into that in just a second. So again, what's in it for um, the members of your community as well as potentially new members to come? The perception of banking is improved. Because this is fun, it's friendly, it's very accessible to people of all levels, there's not that mistrust um, that may exist today among our generation. And tying into that, that trust is really what builds the ties that create the community that you as a company are trying to build. And it does create that personalization. And that personalization leads into benefit number three, which is the high switching cost. So once I put in all of this information about my habits and the system starts to really get to know me, then it makes it much more difficult for me to leave back to TD. Um, for you, obviously, this means that you have very loyal customers, which is actually a very strong differentiator against the other competitors that you face today. Um, it also is a way to attract new members because it's interactive and it's not scary to do online banking anymore. And finally, 
um, again, this emphasis on data, you can actually understand consumer habits and by doing this you can target other, other offerings that you have into their online accounts and maybe try and you know, sell other services or offerings that you have. So in terms of this data, this is one of my favorite topics right now, um, but we do want to emphasize that this entire concept would start out as a pilot and one of the purposes of the data is to test the pilot and then see how to modify things of course. But ongoing throughout the project, um, you would collect two different types of data. The first one is behavioral and the second is psychographic, but these two go very much hand in hand. Um, the reason behind this is that many industry competitors, not only in banking but in general, make this a base case um, scenario where they are only gathering demographic data. So it may be where they're located, how much time they're spending online, but it doesn't actually demonstrate anything about their behavior. So a lot of decisions are based off of assumptions and inferences and they're not accurate business decisions. However, by doing these personality quizzes, um, it actually creates a workaround where you can retain trust with your users and they're giving you information about their daily lives. For instance, you could ask a question, how many hours a week do you spend at work? And that already gives you so much insight onto what their life looks like. Um, so in terms of gathering this data, you can gather it in two different ways. You can get public data by having this functionality available to anybody who comes onto the website. And then you can have even more accurate personalized data by adding this module into the actual online banking account. And that's where the personalization comes in. Um, and then again, the, like, this allows you to understand the consumers and basically um, another success story of where this really worked is actually Buzz BuzzFeed. Every time we do an online quiz to figure out what hamburger topping we are and we answer like which Disney movie do you relate most to, that's actually a sponsorship of Disney trying to understand which movie do they want to remake soon. So this is a really subtle way to get that behavioral data um, and it retains the trust and relationship with the consumer. Yeah. <clears throat> so let's talk about the, the marketing funnel. Right? Um, you, you have your overall market and currently um, Desjardins owns 7 million members. Um, of, the, of the overall market. Now, how do you actually get there? Well, <clears throat> you're gonna start off <clears throat> with the overall, excuse me. Go into the awareness that's uh, currently being generated. Um, what does TD offer? And then go into the engagement. Oh, they offer this, do I actually want to consider this in, in versus BMO? And perhaps by implementing our strategy, I will. <laughs> and finally, the conversion is the last part, going from that top line to the bottom line, right? And so, um, our strategy currently uh, tackles the uh, engagement and conversion. So the engagement comes more within uh, the part of the, the internal uh, user experience that, that's being offered, all of these different um, interface um, segments that we talked about, and the, and the conversion into the loyalty. So that final bubble there, like keeping that 7 million and growing that eventually, that comes from the fact of these high switching costs, right? They have their data within your system. They un this community, Desjardins, understands what the users want and they can help them. And by switching to another bank, they don't get any of these benefits. Therefore, they will stay with you. Now, what we're missing is this final part uh, at the top. How do you get this uh, market into uh, the awareness and the engagement uh, uh, parts? Which is, we're gonna start off with the network effects. And that's really important. Why is that important? Well, that's important because Desjardins um, and, um, operates a little bit differently from the other banks because you have this aspect of community. It's about the people, it's about how people interact, it's about building that trust by me telling Valeria, hey, I'm gonna bank with Desjardins, because you're really cool. And then, with that, with that um, personal um, interaction there, she's gonna be a lot more convinced. Right? So we're gonna be leveraging these network effects using ex existing young members to go into non-members, for example, those who are starting full time. And how are we gonna do that? Well, for example, the game, right? We had that public uh, aspect that they could, they could play with, and if they're convinced with that, then seeing that login segment to, to get more private data, well, they're gonna be more enticed to, to convert, right? But we're missing one step though. And that step is not really something that we miss, but more of a catalyst. And that's a promotional aspect. Now we do know that in the information provided, you guys specifically said that promotion shouldn't be there. And we think that that could be a great catalyst for that next part, going back to this bubble track. Um, here, this upper part, if you increase more awareness about what Desjardins does, right, that it is just as good as all of the other big five banks in the market, that it is just as secure, but that it brings in this community aspect, that's where you're gonna win. So, let's just imagine this. So I'm just entering into university and I don't know what bank I'm going to bank with because I just came from an international high school and I'm all the way to Canada and no one's here to give me advice, so I have to make this decision by myself. 
So who do I go with? Well, I ask around and I ask my friends and they tell me just, okay, just try out this game with Desjardins to just map out your life plan. You can click different options and see where you want to invest. If you want to trade, maybe what job you're going to get in the future. And from then I start playing this game and I realize, okay, maybe I can map it out. But I realize because I don't bank with uh, Desjardins, I don't have any of my options saved. So what do I do is that maybe, okay, maybe I'll try out Desjardins, maybe I'll like it. So I go, I do the whole game again and I figure out what I like. And then I spend money here, I spend money there through university through the year. And then I realize, oh, what did I spend things on? Well, now that I know that Desjardins has a really user-friendly um, interface, I can go on and see, oh, maybe I spent 25% of my budget on Uber, I spent 15% on food, maybe I should cut down a little here and there. And it's just super easy and really wants me to stay banking with Desjardins because you're so user friendly and it's so visual and fun to see. And so, and then as I go on through my life, you have my life plan already mapped out, so why would I switch? Even if Tangerine has, let's say, a really high savings plan that maybe if I switch into, I can get 10 more dollars, I wouldn't do that because I'm already invested in the Desjardins community. <coughs> So just some key considerations to um, look at is that the first of which is the diction. So we have to make sure that it's really simplistic for the millennials to understand because that'll change the whole perception of how they see banks. Secondly, we really want to um, so we really want the forms of reports, navigations, and instructions. So this is just, we want to make sure that you have all the data. And then lastly, we want to really emphasize key terms. So the formatting. So this is all just in terms of the user face that you have to keep in mind going forward. And so just our last year capabilities. So I realize we have two minutes left, so I'll power through this <laughs> as quickly as I can. So the, you asked us to categorize uh, the different costs that we have. These are roughly how it's going to amount to in terms of distributions. We could talk through more of that during the Q&A. Now essentially, by implementing all of this within the next three years, um, you will increase your current market segment by this, enlarge all of these because of the increase in conversion, increase in awareness and engagement to a bigger circle, essentially. And then that inner circle, the gray one, is going to stay a lot more loyal. So right now you have 7 million. We're projecting per perhaps increasing that to 10, 11 million in the next three to five years. Oops. Oh, okay, I can tackle this, that's fun. Um, so in terms of the implementation, we wanted to use um, project management IS best practices. And um, as you can see, I mean, like this is a pretty straightforward uh, approach where we really want to emphasize the iterations taken in the execution and testing. Um, there should be three iterations and I can run you through our strategy behind that as well. But until we do that, um, we just want to summarize that again, this recommendation will really change the perception, attract new users or new members and also uh, retain the loyal ones. So thank you, we open the floor to any questions. Um, so, so within your customer journey, mm -hmm. how do you like, administrate your game and your cruise uh, within the, the experience of uh, a member? <laughs> yeah, so actually we did think about both channels. Um, at the end of the day, we think it would be up to you to make the final decision if you want to launch both at the same time or start with one or the other. But an example of how the consumer journey would be as an existing member, um, the same way that we face a pop-up uh, when we log on to our online banking that asks to add a phone number or change the password, you could simply administer a pop-up that says try our new game feature. And many users will be interested and then when they click on that accept button or the arrow, it will open a new tab to the public website um, where the game is actually hosted and then they can go through it. Then if they enjoy the game when this is officially launched, there could be a button that says add to my online banking and then every time they log in it will be a module sort of under accounts and documents and everything like that. Then from the public side and the non-members, like I said, this uh, functionality would be hosted on the public site. So after I tried this out and I'm a member and I enjoyed it and I know Rachel has her intro to finance midterm next week, I can say, Rachel, this is a great tool. Why don't you use it to practice and study? Then she can go on the online website and then her consumer journey begins. And moreover, I'm a very competitive person. <laughs> so when I see that Valeria is going to do really well and get 13% return on her investment game, I'm going to want to beat her. Oh, I'm going to try it. He's going to beat me. <laughs> And it will. <laughs> How would you integrate the brand values, like the cooperative community value, within your game? 
I can answer that as well. Um, it's really emphasizing the knowledge. So for us, knowledge is what builds the community um, because like I said in the beginning of the presentation, that's a really big common denominator among millennials. So that's kind of like a generational demographic value. So leveraging that value and tying that into your brand as this knowledge building, knowledge sharing and empowering bank um, is really what's gonna connect and liaise all of the, the concepts. Yeah, and if I could just add to that too, and because this kind of game of life is going to be played, so you are gonna be with your consumers from the beginning all the way hopefully to the end because they don't, they're not going to want to switch out of Desjardins and that's going to build the community because you're actually going to be able to build the relationship with your individual members and like we love that you call them members instead of clients because that's what they are. They're here, you're here to build relationships with them and we think through this game it's really going to be able to um, personal, make it like more personal and make them want to stay with you in the long run as well. And how would you think, like, uh, if someone would were to become a member and use the game, and by the end of the game or by the middle, or to be interested in any product that we offer, how would you link that with the the offer that we have, like the the, the physical one or the yeah. the offer online, yeah. so that the people can get the product that they need? I, I, could, I could take that. So essentially, when Valera talked about the game of life, there's the aspects about the actual stock itself. For example, I'm going to buy Apple or Google, whichever stock. But there's also your preferences that you would see, right? For example, I am more risk averse or I am more um, um, return driven. And then you could promote your products through that. If we have an ETF that are going to be more on large cap stocks or we have an ETF on more emerging markets, which is going to have higher returns, right? So this is crucial because it brings the data that you need. Right? And this is not the only game you could launch. You could launch other types of similar um, um, products within your interface in order to really gather that data. But all of that is going to allow you to empower this uh, community segment, which is what uh, is unique about Desjardins compared to the other banks. So would you see all of these products to be offered online? Because let's say, for example, right now, like if you were to get a mortgage, it's not possible to get it 100% online. So would you see that this would have to change, or would you see it like happening like yeah, I think it kind of depends on how you structure the game. For example, you could have something like test out some of our ETFs that you're thinking about and then run the simulation yeah. and see what's the best fit for you. But alternatively, um, it almost reminds me of when you get a free online quote from like a service online. So you put in some personal information and then you're fed back a quote based on the criteria that you put in. So you could implement something similar to that. Yeah, and then if they like that, so just to add on again, <laughs> if they like what they see, for example, with the mortgage, then you can also implement your number underneath so that they can call into the line or call into whoever they're banking with or with you and like the <laughs> customer service and say, uh, we would like to, we saw this in your game and we'd really like to implement this in real life. How can we do so? And then you can help them with that, and then you can upsell that way as well. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. I think we have some time. <laughs> Challenge accepted. With the quiz, how do you um, get answers from from user? Because on the feed, I'm, I, I trust that I, I can say, okay, I know more Tarzan than uh, any other uh, movie. But so when, when, when you see like a secret area, like financial uh, mm -hmm. world, uh, I don't have trust on the. Thank you very much. That concludes the No. <laughs> <laughs> can we answer the question? No. Oh. Well, you can add us on LinkedIn and we can have a conversation. <laughs> 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 Should we shake hands? Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much for your time. <laughs>